Alrighty, welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're here. I think this is our sixth weekly understanding behavior live study hall. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Nick and I'm a test prep instructor. I've been doing this for a bit over five years now. I have over 1500 classroom hours teaching test prep. So let's just say I kind of know my stuff a little bit. Um, so uh, right now in these study halls, you're able to put any topic that you would like to discuss into the chat. Uh, if you put it into chat, I will throw it onto here. The earlier ones that get thrown on here are more likely to be hit, so make sure you throw your topics in now if you have something that you would like to uh, review or discuss tonight. Um, couple quick things. So um, I've been doing some little housekeeping on all my websites and stuff. So now I have a link tree. I actually pinned it to uh, the YouTube chat so you can check that up there. Um, this has one spot, um, one stop shop for all of my links here. And then you may have noticed the Understanding Behavior Shop has also been revamped, looking really pretty. Um, I've also added a new option for BCBA tutoring with a buddy. So if you do have a study buddy that you uh, study with regularly, uh, you can go through this and you can buy um, the session just for you. And then both of you um, buy that and we can attend it together. Or you can purchase for um, you and your buddy from here. So um, pretty cool stuff. I'm proud of it. So I had to show it off a little bit. Um, also, I will be sending out the <clears throat> um, feedback for, uh, or sorry, not the feedback. I will be sending out the notes from this session to anybody that is here. I posted a link to the form above. All you have to do is just fill out that quick form, um, and then I will have your email address so I can email this out to you afterwards. Okay, cool. I see a couple more things in here. Yeah, so function-based versus topography-based definitions, excellent. Perfect. All right, cool. Well, I think that's enough to get us started. Feel free. We should have some time to do some more as well, so feel free to um, throw additional topics in as they come to your head. <clears throat> okay, first up, we're going to talk about DRD versus DRL. So this is, um, honestly, I wish like DRD should have never been invented. <laughs> uh, I think, and this is Nick thinks, uh, it is a fairly useless term. And let's talk about why and what the differences actually are. Um, so this is actually something I did make an infographic on. So if you follow my Facebook or Instagram pages, you may have already seen this already. So um, and let me know if you like infographics like this. I, I kind of I want to make some more, but it, only if you guys like really want to, because they're kind of effortful to make sometimes. Um, so DRL versus DRD, DRL is kind of like the overarching term. So it's a more, it's a broader term than DRD. Um, so DRL has three different subtypes. We have space responding, interval responding, and then full session responding. So whenever we use the term DRL, this can relate to any three of these. If we use the term DRD, it could relate to interval or full session DRL, but DRD will never refer to this spaced responding um, DRL, which is like that IRT based DRL. Awesome, cool, yeah, glad you like the graphic, Lenny. Cool stuff. Um, so here is also like um, instructions on how to use this for the exam. I know it's kind of small here, uh, but hopefully you can see. So if a question has both D, and actually I'll copy this into the notes. Let me do that instead. So um, here is the, is the kind of our process. If a question has both DRD and DRL as an answer, first you need to figure out which subtype it is. So that's gonna be our um, interval responding, or sorry, interval DRL, full session DRL, or the space responding DRL. Then we ask, is this space responding? So if it is, then your answer is gonna be DRL. If it's not, they're probably more likely looking for DRD because that's a more specific answer. 
sometimes that happens on the exam. Like there's two correct answers on the, uh, in your answer options. And in that case, you always want to pick the more specific answer that relates to your exact scenario. Um, so if you did run into DRL versus DRD and you noted that it was one of these kinds of DRL, then you would want to select DRD. It's more likely to be correct because it's a little bit more specific. Hopefully that makes sense and helps um, clarify that. Let's go ahead. It looks like we've got a couple more on here. So let's add these to the list. Matching law versus behavior contrast. Very cool. Love that topic. And then behavioral skills training. Sweet. Okay, cool. So uh, actually last time we, um, or maybe it was two weeks ago, we did a little bit of discussion on IOA. And when we did that, we actually looked at the discontinuous types of IOA. Um, so let's actually just list these all out here. Maybe we can just get some, some brief info that would, might help you out. So our discontinuous type um, of IOA, remember we choose this based off of um, how much the behavior is occurring. And um, interval by interval is always like our safe default option. So the three different types that we had, we had our interval by interval. We have our scored interval. And then we have our unscored interval. Um, so scored interval, remember, um, when we're selecting this, we want to focus on what's more interesting in the data. So we'll use this with low rate behavior because um, if there's not very much behavior occurring, that means not very many of our intervals are going to get scored. So that's going to be like the more interesting part of our data is when we actually score that interval because there's fewer of those. Kind of um, similar but opposite for unscored. We use it for high rate behavior because it's more likely that fewer of those intervals are going to be not scored because most of them are scored. Um, so honestly, uh, I believe the person who requested to talk about IOA was like, um, let's talk about the formulas behind IOA. I'm actually not a big fan of the formulas, especially if you're not a math person. I actually consider myself a math person and I don't like the formulas. I think that they may uh, overcomplicate things. Um, what you want to think about is what IOA actually is. So let's actually break that down. Um, IOA stands for Inter-Observer Agreement. And what this is, is a, it's a comparison between the data sets of two independent observers um, and how well their data match. So uh, when we're doing like our, um, our discontinuous, we can do a quick little example here. So here's observer one, here's observer two. Um, let's actually add another row here, another column rather. Um, so let's say that we have plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, and then we'll have minus, plus, minus, minus. So like, you don't need a formula to do IOA here. All you need to do is take the, um, is see how well we agree here. So if they're the same, then we do agree for the interval. If they are different, then we'll do disagree. So for this first one, um, they're both pluses, so this one is going to be in agreeance. Um, this one, there's two minuses, so again, that we agree there that they're all the same. Uh, the plus and minus here, we have a disagree, again, disagree, and then final um, one, we have agree. And then we'll just take agreements over the total. Agreements divided by total. In this case, we have 3 divided by 5 equals 60% for IOA. So try not to get too tangled up in the formulas. Um, if we were to do scored interval, we'd only focus on the ones where one observer would said scored. So we would discount this one and discount this one because neither observer said it was scored. Um, so that one would just be 1 out of 3 then. So we have the 1 agreeance uh, and then the 2 disagrees. 
And then if we were to do that unscored, um, it's kind of similar, except we're going to uh, discard the ones that, um, that we have that are scored. So we'll discard these three, and then we'd have um, two agreances. Or sorry, we would have the two agreances. Uh, we would count these as well because they had an unscored in there. So we would, this would be two out of four, 50% IOA. Is that clicking? I, I'm seeing chat slow down a little bit when we get to IOA. I know we're, no, not all uh, behavior analysts in training are math numbers people. How, how are you guys feeling in chat? Are you guys still with me? You hanging? IOA feeling okay? Making a little bit more sense? Let me just hear, are you feeling more comfortable with this now than you did five minutes ago? <laughs> I know, Robin, IOA is the worst, but that's what we're here. Good, I'm glad to hear. Okay, so that was our discontinuous IOA. Um, if you were here uh, a week or two ago when we discussed that, maybe this is a little bit of a review for you. Um, yeah, so a minus would be that it's not scored, so um, that we just scored it as a zero, zero behavior for that interval. Yep. All right, let's talk about our continuous IOA. And really all I want you to think about here is that we have total, mean, and exact. Um, one really important note, um, so these uh, can be used with um, any of our continuous measurements. Uh, note, um, exact uh, cannot be used, let's bold highlight this, cannot be used with time-based measurements. So in, when we're doing exact IOA, it's kind of similar to this, but um, instead of having the pluses and minuses, we'll have the values. Um, so if we're doing like duration, for example, um, it's what we're doing in an exact IOA is we need the two observers to match up exactly. So in duration, like it's really difficult to have two timers like line up on the second. So it's very unlikely that um, that's going to even work out. So that's why we would, we would not use like an exact duration IOA. It would, we would just, it does not make sense. Exact duration, exact latency, exact IRT. We don't take those kinds of IOA. Uh, we would do it for exact count or exact rate. Um, so total, um, this is like our crudest form of IOA. Um, let's actually get some data in here. We can just mess around with it. So let's just pretend we're doing some rate data. Um, do, 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 five, five, four, four, two, three, three, two, or three, six, I don't know. Something like that. Okay. So um, in our total IOA, what we do is we um, just take the small number divided by the big number. Isn't that a way better formula than whatever you were trying to memorize? Small number divided by big number. Sweet. 8 divided by 10, we got 80%. Um, so same thing here. If they're equal, these are going to be 100%. So we have these two are equal. Um, then we have two out of three. Got 67% here. And then we have our three out of six, which is going to be 50%. Easy math. Um, so to do the total IOA here, um, you could actually just, we actually did it interval by interval here. Um, so it, for mean IOA, what we would do is we would average out all of these percentages now. Um, so we average out the percentages of each interval. Um, and then in exact IOA, what we actually, or sorry, total IOA, what we do is that um, they uh, take the, like the small number over the big number, but we can add all these totals up. So if we did 8 plus 5, 13, so now we have 17, 19, 22. Um, this one is going to be 19, 22, 28. So we can actually just take these two numbers, 22 divided by 28, and that gets us 78.5%. Um, so take the small number divided by a big number, and you can add uh, um, this up for each observation.
So mean IOA now is when we um, average all of these percentages together. So that would be slightly different. So if we did 80 plus 100, 100, 67, and 50, add those together, divided by 5, we would get our mean IOA. And then our exact IOA, what this is, is that um, it's basically kind of like all or nothing. So in this one, if they don't exactly match, they count as zeros. So in this one, it's the strictest four of IOA because this one's only giving us 40%. That's really low IOA. <laughs> um, um, and then the other one here, this w like our total was giving us 78.5% IOA. So just be, like the type of IOA that you use can change your numbers pretty drastically. Um, so this is the strictest type of IOA. And it's just, uh, what I mean by that is like it's the most likely uh, to give low scores. All right. I think we're all getting a little burnt out about IOA, so let's go ahead and move on. <coughs> all right, our next topic, we did a lot of discussion on rule governed behavior last time. I also posted a clip of this on my YouTube channel, so uh, make sure you go check that out because um, we're not going to go as thorough through it. Um, but let's get through these definitions. Um, rules, what these are, are descriptions of behavioral contingencies. So um, it's something that describes an outcome. It can describe a delayed outcome as well. So it's like if I order a pizza, then I'm going to get a pizza in my door in an hour. So very delayed outcome, but that rule can still control that behavior. Um, but it can also like do simple outcomes too. It's like, oh, if you have a sore throat, if you drink tea, it'll get, it'll get better. So that could even happen immediately, um, but that rule could still describe that behavioral contingencies. That's not out of bounds for it. Uh, rule governed behavior. <laughs> this is like the worst definition ever, but it's uh, behavior that is under the control of a rule. And we have the definition of a rule right there. So it's controlled, uh, behavior that's controlled by that description of the behavioral contingency. Not necessarily contacting that contingency, but um, but the rule itself, that verbal description of describing it. I'm just I'm gonna add that into our definition. It's the verbal descriptions of behavioral contingencies. And then in, honestly, instructions we usually don't um, like define these that differently in this category. Um, but you can think about just a, an instruction as. Um, it's either like how to do something or like a demand to do something. Um, so, it's so instructions, um, like if I were to teach you how to ski, like I might verbally describe that. It would be some um, instructions or it could just, or like an instruction could be like go skiing. That's different than a, uh, a description of behavioral contingency because I'm not describing an outcome. I'm just saying, do this. As you can see, I'm really excited for ski season. <laughs> um, cool. Alyssa, did that cover everything you were looking for there? Let me know. All right, yeah, we got a question in chat. Make sure um, you can f ask questions at any time, too. Feel free to hop in. Um, so Lauren here is asking, would a do not enter sign be considered rule govern or a response prompt, and can you explain why? So, um, so actually, kind of, you um, kind of trick it there. So, it would definitely be. Um, so, one thing you have to understand is that any stimulus can have multiple functions. And what you need to look at is what function is this stimulus having in this scenario. So um, in this one, the do not enter sign, it is a verbal prompt, which is a type of response prompt. I always um, like to go that way first, like identify the individual type, then categorize. Um, so it is a verbal prompt, response prompt does fit that category, um, and it's going to make you more likely not to enter or to go somewhere else. 
Um, but it's difficult to tell, and, it, and often this is the case, it's difficult to tell when rule governed behavior um, is in effect, but that is definitely a, a thing that could, um, be, that could present a rule because it says do not enter. But you'd also have to look at the history of, ex of that individual experiencing do not enter signs. Was this paired with a bad outcome in the past? Because if it just says do not enter, then it's possible that there's not a bad outcome. It just says don't do it. Like well, I might, I might challenge that. I'd be like, oh, what if I do though? <laughs> um, so it's more of an instruction than a rule because it's not describing a contingency. But if the person has um, experience that do not enter sign and bad outcomes or even thoughts of bad outcomes of um, related to that or associated with that sign, then we might say rules are more controlling that behavior. Excellent question. Really um, good discussion there. Does that all make sense, Lauren? Cool. So yeah, main thing I would focus on is that like if it is either or this, this or that rather, but what is it functioning as in this moment and how does it relate to the scenario? Cool. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. We're going to talk about motivating operations, one of my favorite topics. So a motivating operation, let's get our definition. This is a stimulus that alters the value of another stimulus as a reinforcer or punisher. Um, so if we put that into layman's terms, what that means is that we have um, something that makes um, something else cooler or shittier. Um, so for example, like our simplest, um, simplest forms of motivating operations um, are deprivation and satiation. Uh, so deprivation, this is when, uh, when you um, have not recently consumed a reinforcer, uh, which increases the value of that reinforcer. So for example, if I don't drink water for a few hours, then water becomes a more stronger, uh, uh, stronger reinforcer. So it's the not experiencing that in a few um, hours, that's the stimulus and it's affecting the water, making that a stronger reinforcer. All right, quick question in chat. What's the difference between a prompt and an instruction? I really wouldn't worry too much about instructions overall. Instructions are kind of just like demands, um, where a prompt is going to be something that makes it more likely. Um, so I guess the difference is like whether it makes it more likely or not, and that would make it a prompt if it did. Um, but if it was just a demand and didn't do so, then it would just be an instruction. I wouldn't worry about that differentiation too much, though. I, do, I don't think you're going to see much on just like what is an instruction on the exam. That's not really a behavior analytic term. All right, let's look at satiation. This is the opposite. Um, so this is overconsumption of a reinforcer, um, uh, which uh, decreases the value of that reinforcer. Now, who knows what I mean uh, when I say like value of a reinforcer? It's kind of like a tricky concept, and it actually gets a little bit mathematical. And we are, I know you're probably just like, oh, Nick, we just did IOA. I'm over math. Um, but we need to think about it as um, a mathematical thing. So, yeah, Robin's saying like how much you want something. I think that's a good way to like describe a value of a reinforcer in layman's terms. But how can we break down like value of a reinforcer in technical? terms. And my hint here, I'm going to give you a little bit of time to work with this in chat if you're feeling up to a challenge, which hopefully you are because challenges make life exciting. Um, but let's look at, um, at like what this, how this relates to reinforcement. So again, reinforcement is an increase in behavior due to a, um, um, a stimulus change. Yeah, Ava, I like where you're going. It's effectiveness. Can you go a little bit more onto that? Really good, though. Um, 
Yeah, Jory, you're on the right track. So that's actually one part of what an MO does, but not the part that we're talking about with the value of the reinforcer at the moment. But nice try there. So again, what we're um, what we're thinking about now is like technically, what does like value of a reinforcer mean, and how does it relate to reinforcement? Yeah, Tiffany. So um, let's go ahead and talk about that real quick because it uh, seems like a couple people are on that trend here. Um, what we're going to look at, at there is um, behavior altering effects of a, of an mo. This is what makes a behavior more or less likely. So MOs do have behavior altering effects, but a lot of things have behavior altering effects. Reinforcement has behavior altering effects. Um, prompts have behavior altering effects. Rules have behavior altering effects. SDs have behavior altering effects. Um, specifically to MOs, this is the one thing that changes value of a reinforcer. So um, that's what we're trying to break down right now is technically what is this value of a reinforcer referring to? And it's kind of it's kind of difficult to phrase. I'm not going to lie. Let's take maybe like 20, 30 more seconds there. Think about it. Still getting used to this camera. I don't know how it zoomed me out. Oh, there we go. We can zoom back in. <laughs> but yeah, you guys get to see my whole world. Guess that might be cool though. I don't know. Okay, so let's go ahead and review this. It is very, very tricky. Um, okay, so our our value of our reinforcer, what we're looking at is how much um, a behavior will increase when this um, stimulus that there's an MO for is used as a reinforcer. So kind of tricky there. So value of a reinforcer relates to how much this behavior is going to increase. That's the only way that we know if something is a reinforcer is um, if it increases. So now we're not just looking at if it increases the behavior, we're looking at how much it increases behavior. So um, have you ever been to like a really nice restaurant that had like amazing food that you really liked, but the first time you went there, you were like really full? So um, in that situation, it's likely that it, um, your MO was actually um, having some suppressing effect on how powerful this food was going to be as a reinforcer. So it was, like you could recognize like it's amazing food, I'm just like not that hungry, so it like ugh, it could have been better if I was hungrier. Um, so if we look at the value of the reinforcement and the value of the reinforcer and how much that affects that due to that MO, uh, what we might see in a parallel universe is if you went to that same restaurant but super hungry, that you might actually visit that restaurant significantly more frequently than the universe where you went to that restaurant for the first time and you were super full. Um, and that's the power of the effect of the MO and how we're relating it to the value of the reinforcer is that uh, a bigger MO, a stronger MO is actually going to have further increases on the behavior that produces the reinforcer that there's a motivating operation for. Whew, I, s I feel like I just said a million words and I hopefully it didn't sound all like jargon. How are you guys feeling on that? Give me like a quick thumbs up, thumbs down. Give me like a happy, sad face and emoji if you're like, wow, that's really clicking or like, whoa, Nick, you just blew my mind and I'm more confused than before. How are we feeling? Cool, Ava's feeling good, Lady's feeling good. Cool, Robin's feeling a little better. Natalie, a little questionable, okay. Cool, cool. <laughs> All right, thanks guys. Uh, yeah, appreciate the feedbacks. Uh, so 
Uh, let's talk a little bit more here. So um, the main thing that the motivating operation does is, again, we're altering that value of another stimulus as a reinforcer or punisher. Um, okay, so, um, so we talked about that value of the reinforcer. Our two words that we're going to look here, uh, look at here are our establishing operation and then abolishing operation. Um, establishing operation is going to increase um, the effectiveness of a reinforcer. And then abolishing operations are going to decrease the effectiveness of a reinforcer. Then we talked um, a little bit about the behavior altering effects. So re uh, remember, a lot of things have behavior altering effects. So um, behavior altering effects, we're more looking at what's happening in the moment. Um, we can uh, also like, conceptualize the value of the reinforcer effect as like um, how um, how much um, the mo affects the future rate of behavior. And that might be a nice, um, easier way to contrast the value versus behavior altering effects, um, where um, um, in the behavior altering effects, we're looking at if it makes the behavior more or less likely in the moment. Um, I also um, really like this word. You should get comfortable with this word if you're not comfortable with it, um, the word likely or likelihood. Um, this is almost interchangeable with rate, but when we're, whenever we're talking about a future moment or, um, or like anything that evokes behavior, likely is really the best word to use. So start sticking it into your vocabulary if it's not quite there yet. Um, let's go ahead and, um, and look at this. Our two terms are the evocative effect and the abative effect. Um, and um, it's kind of simple here where like the E words um, are always talking about increases and then the A words are always talking about decreases. Um, so hopefully you can make that connection. Evocative effect is um, it makes behavior more likely in the moment. And then the abative effect makes it less likely in the moment. Cool, cool. So MO is super cool. Um, they are um, different from SDs. I would uh, a lot of students, um, even like pretty skilled analysts, get SDs and MOs mixed up all the time. And I think it's, uh, the main reason is because they're not as focused on the value of the reinforcer um, with the MOs. Um, so that's the main difference that you want to focus on is value of reinforcers with our MOs availability of a consequence with our SDs. Okay, okay. Cool. I um, appreciate all of your interaction here tonight. Uh, we are doing pretty well on time. We should actually be able to get through a couple more topics if um, you guys have them. So feel free to throw them into chat. We can still add more to our list. Um, next up, we're going to talk about function versus uh, topography-based definitions. Okay, so um, here's the thing, is that uh, all operational definitions describe topography. So um, again, this is one of my uh, study tricks here, or, t um, quest or even question answering trick rather, um, is that if two things have a similarity, then we don't need to focus on it. We need to focus on the difference. Um, so both function-based um, definitions and topography-based definitions have topography. So let's not worry about that. Um, so um, only function-based um, definitions will describe the consequences of the behavior. So essentially, um, if a definition describes a consequence, it's function based. Um, so don't focus on whether it describes the topography or not. Focus on if it describes the function. If it does, it's a function based definition. If it doesn't describe the function or the consequence of the behavior, then it's not a function based definition.
All right, cool. Yeah, Alyssa wanted to go over the Facebook question that uh, was posted just like an hour ago, so we can do that. Um, yeah, feel free to throw some other topics into the list as well. We should have some time. Next up, let's talk about matching law versus behavior contrast. Matching law is pretty cool. So what we're looking at here is concurrent schedules of reinforcement. And concurrent schedules, this is uh, multiple schedules of reinforcement um, available at the same time. You've probably heard the phrase, uh, behavior goes where reinforcement flows. Um, and that's essentially what matching law is talking about, is that where there is reinforcement and where that aligns with our MOs and our SDs and our rules, um, that's where our behavior is going to be allocated. Uh, the more that you're able to control a, about your setting, the more you're able to see matching law uh, occur. Um, and matching law, <laughs> why do we keep going to this? Uh, but matching law is actually a mathematical equation. Um, then there are some, um, there are some mega nerds um, out there who view um, the behavior or let's say all behavior of every individual through this lens um, and through equations. Uh, there's some really big nerds out there. Um, I'm slightly less nerdy than those people. I, I do really appreciate the matching law and the math and the math behind it. Um, so essentially, um, we have um, like response one equals to um, like the ratio of um, it's, it's, let's not get into the math here. Um, but essentially, if we have uh, reinforcement schedules that um, allow like different proportions of reinforcement, then we'll see behavior get allocated to those different proportions of reinforcement. Um, so let's look at like some Skinner box arrangements with two lever with two levers. So the first arrangement, what we have is that uh, lever one is on an FR3 schedule, lever two is on a VR8 schedule. So anybody um, have an idea about like how the rat might respond here? Like which lever is he gonna press and why? Let's make these numbers a little easier. I'm gonna need to make this one seven. How is how how about the Skinner or how about this rat allocate as respondents? We have two levers. This one's FR three. This one's VR seven. How might this rat respond here? Anybody know? Anybody feeling really brave? Good. Yeah, Tiffany and Ava, right on the right track. Let's look at this. So um, the rat would allocate 100% of responding towards lever one after training. Um, the reason why is that FR3 is always a better schedule than VR7. Um, so there is no reason to hit, uh, hit lever two. Um, so um, after the rat learns that this one just produces the, the pellets of food or water faster, um, he's just gonna allocate all of his responding there. This is a little different when we have two interval schedules. Um, let's go through this and we'll talk a little bit about math. I know math, but um, here we go. Um, first one is gonna be a VR, um, or sorry, not a VR, is this gonna be a VI 30 seconds. Then we're gonna have lever two. Um, this is gonna be a VI 20 second. If I can type today. So what we want to look at here is that um, if this is a variable interval 30 seconds, the rat uh, it can earn at most two reinforcers per minute 
if he maximizes responding. Same thing here. Um, Rat can earn at most three reinforcers per minute if he maximizes responding. So what I mean by that is that since it's about every 20 seconds, he can earn a reinforcer. If he's doing that at maximum, then he gets three per minute every 20 seconds. Um, so total uh, per minute, the rat uh, can earn five reinforcers. So what matching law says is that um, matching law predicts rat will allocate 40% of his lever presses towards lever one, and the rat will allocate 60% of his lever presses towards lever two. So um, the ratio here, two divided by five is 40%, is exactly equal um, to the responding that occurs. So it's the rate of reinforcement equals the rate of responding. Um, and then again, for our second response, we have the same thing, rate of reinforcement equals the rate of responding. Um, and this actually happens. If you, um, you can recreate this in the RAT lab and uh, we can see matching law occur. Um, one really cool study, because I'm like uh, a cool study nerd, um, is that um, there was a, a big meta-analysis of college basketball players, um, college basketball players um, who um, shot either two or three pointers. And the meta-analysis confirmed that the allocation of, uh, of them shooting two or three pointers uh, was um, mathematically related to um, the percentage of points they obtained from shooting either two or three pointers. So for matching law to really take place, to have it control a behavior this precisely, what we need to do is we need to have a behavior that occurs uh, a million times. So if you think about a college basketball player, they shoot baskets thousands of times a season. Um, and, then, um, and then we have to have it contact the, that different reinforcement. So uh, it's a, a little bit messier with the basketball because they get um, extra, they get 50% more points if they get the three pointer, but they're probably less accurate at it. But the math works out where they um, actually were allocating their shooting exactly towards um, how well they are shooting at that and how successful they were at getting points from that. So I think it's really cool. Um, it's cool to see that matching law actually takes place when we have that those conditions where it's just a behavior occurring under a concurrent schedule setting um, that has occurred thousands of times. And then we see the behavior get allocated according to matching law in those rates of reinforcement. Woo. We are getting into some messy topics tonight, but hopefully this is interesting for you guys and hopefully you feel like you're learning. Um, let's um, talk about this, how it compares to behavior contrast. We won't go as deeply into behavior contrast, but let's do it. So in behavior contrast, what we are looking at is uh, two different settings, um, often signaled by um, some kind of SD. And what we see is that uh, one environmental change causes a behavior to increase or decrease in that um, in the in that setting, and then behavior contrast occurs um, when the behavior changes in the opposite direction in setting two. So to simplify this, um, there's change in behavior or change in environment. Sorry, setting one, change in environment, um, and then it changes the behavior. 
setting to no change in the environment behavior changes in the opposite direction so for example if there was a reinforcement for a behavior that was added in our first condition then we're going to see decreases in that behavior in the second condition even though we didn't change anything it's just that the extra reinforcers are provided in this first condition um, similarly, if we see a behavior is punished in the first condition, then we're going to see the behavior increase in the opposite condition. Um, so I think it's like a fun, like real, not, I guess not that fun, but a relatable example uh, might be a divorce uh, couple that has a kid. Uh, so like divorce, so fun. <laughs> um, so. Um, we think we can think about those two settings, either like at mom's house or dad's house. So let's say um, for doing chores at mom's house, you now get five dollars per ten minutes of chores. So you're gonna see chores increase there. Dad doesn't do anything, but he's not doing chores at dad's place because where's the money at? Uh, I can just do it at mom's house, and that's way cooler. Um, so we see that opposite effect. Um, and then let's say at mom's house, uh, she started punishing playing video games. So um, playing video games now decreases. What we might see is the behavior contrast is that at dad's house, you might play more video games um, because um, of that behavior contrast and it, because it was punished or decreased in some way in the first setting at mom's place. Um, so like divorced parents, uh, mom's place versus dad's place. And then I just gave uh, two examples. So like say, um, playing video games was limited at mom's place. Um, this causes an increase of playing at dad's. And then let's say uh, mom started paying to do chores. What we might see is a decrease in doing chores at dad's. Um, so for behavior contrast, we also have positive versus negative behavior contrast. Uh, the rule here, the only thing you need to focus on is focus on the change in the um, second condition. Um, so for example, positive contrast, get this highlight off. Um, behavior increases in uh, unchanged condition, our second condition, and then negative contrast is the opposite. Behavior decreases in the unchanged, unchanged condition. So playing video games was limited at mom's place. Is this positive or negative behavior contrast? Let's see it, chat. Looking good. Yeah, Ava, Natalie, nailing it. Perfect. This one is positive contrast. So nothing changed at dad's place. That was our condition two. And then we saw an increase, which is our positive. Again, always focus on that change in the second condition. Excelente. And then um, how about mom's... Uh, starting to pay to, uh, to do chores. What kind of contrast do we have here? Cool. Yeah, looking good. Natalie D. Perfect. This one is going to be negative contrast because on that unchanged setting, we saw the behavior decrease. All right. Looking good. Looking good. Nice there, Tiffany, as well. Okay. 
On to BS team. Um, this stands for behavioral skills training. You may have also heard this um, called competency um, based training. Perfect. Um, yeah, Veronica, I am going to be sharing these notes with you. Absolutely. All you have to do is to fill out this form that I just threw into chat. So check that out, and then um, I'll send the notes out to either tonight or early tomorrow morning. Um, okay, so behavioral skills training, also called competency-based training. Um, what this is, is this is a procedure used to train any skill to a highly verbal individual. Um, so um, people you can use this with, you can use it for your verbal clients, you can use it for your RBTs, you can use it for other BCBAs, um, you can use it for um, parent training too, I've done that. It was actually um, really fun. Uh, one time I did a behavioral skills training on how to do a behavioral skills training for your son. <laughs> um, so that was kind of fun, uh, just breaking down that uh, whole process. Perfect, perfect. Um, yeah, and happy to help, Lenny. I'm glad you're here uh, and taking all this in. Um, really, all I, just, all I want you guys is just to be learning, sharing, um, active participating, um, and I, I love to see that. So as long as you people keep showing up, I'll be here doing this. Um, so thank you guys so much for being here. It really means a lot. Um, so PST, very versatile in that regard. Uh, you can use it with anybody. Um, so let's go ahead and break down the components of the behavioral skills training. First, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, talk about why the skill that we are training is important. So let's say I'm doing a training on uh, how to do how to like create learning opportunities in the natural environment. So I'll be like, okay, well, um, um, this is a really important skill right now because if we provide these opportunities for Johnny, then he's going to um, have these learning opportunities be blended into more natural settings. It's going to create more opportunities for him to learn so he can meet his goals faster. Um, and also it's just going to create more reinforcement opportunities and have um, allow him to have more fun during our sessions. So um, that might ha be how you phrase it. Um, just pretty brief here. It usually doesn't have to be too long. Literally, just like what I just did is planning for this um, category. Uh, then we're going to do is we are going to uh, review how to perform the skill. Um, and we'll do that by providing um, both vocal and written instructions. So get them um, something that they can kind of review on their own time, um, check it out, and then you kind of run them through it so that we can make all those connections between uh, your, what you're teaching and the material for them to review on their own as well. Next one what, uh, up, what you're going to do is going to model the skill. Um, and doing this, you would, might um, explain important features. This is a uh, Nick pro tip. This is one of those times where my failure is going to be your prevented uh, failure is, uh, you know, practice the skill before you do it to training. <laughs> Um, so it's really important uh, to, when you're modeling this skill, get it right the first time because if you slip up, um, first of all, what that does is it uh, loses the confidence of your students and you as a trainer. Second of all, um, it's the first impression. So they might, um, the model might be a really bad prompt and be prompting them to be doing the wrong things um, just like you did. So this, do not underestimate this. I had to embarrass myself to, for that contingency to actually change my behavior. Um, but make sure if you're doing uh, behavioral skills training that you practice the skill before you do the training. So important. <laughs> um, after that, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, provide practice opportunities for the behavior. And during these practice opportunities, we will uh, provide feedback, um, both positive and corrective. 
And then we'll also set like some kind of mastery criteria to move on with the training. So sometimes the mastery criteria is just like, hey, show me this two times in a row um, perfectly and you're good. Um, so it doesn't need to be like that formal. It's not like we have to take like really hard data all the time. Just gonna like make sure that they're meeting your standard. After that, what we'll do is we'll uh, promote and assess generalization to the natural environment. Uh, so to cap off your behavioral skills training, be with uh, your supervisee uh, when they implement the skill for the first time, uh, with the client, and again, provide further feedback. as needed until performing to standard. Cool. So pretty straightforward process. Like if you think about these, all these steps kind of just make sense. Um, but this is our best evidence um, based, sorry, our best evidence based method to teach any skill to a verbal individual. Uh, behavior analysts love this. I love it. It's really, uh, informative and useful. This process works every time if you do it right. Okay. And then lastly, we had a request to review the question that I just posted. So let me go ahead and pull that up for us. This one is on both Instagram and Facebook, whatever your preferred platform is. Um, so here it is. Helen shot a gun for the first time and was thrilled with the experience. Uh, sorry, I just need to get my page back. Where'd it go? Uh. <laughs> uh, and she was thrilled with the experience. Uh, soon after, she starts going to the range every Sunday. Every time she goes, she must buy ammo to shoot, costing $50 and starting to add up against her wallet. Helen now goes to the range to shoot on the first Sunday of every month. Which best uh, matches the described contingency behind buying ammo? Okay. Um, all right, I think I have all my pages back and ready. Um, so yeah, Alyssa was going with negative punishment here. Let's go ahead and break this question down. Um, so first of all, there are a couple different behaviors that we have in this scenario. So um, number one, easiest thing to fix in your question answering process is make sure you're rereading this last sentence of the question and are oriented to what the question is asking about um, because there is a lot of info in here some of it might be unnecessary so this is asking which best matches the described contingency behind buying ammo so let's look at the part where she buys ammo um, she must buy ammo to shoot costing fifty dollars and starting to add up against her wallet um, now we see Helen goes to the range to shoot on the first Sunday of every month. So uh, a couple different things that we see here. First of all, um, what's being described is the uh, removal of a reinforcer. Um, so assuming for most people, $50 is a reinforcer. Um, so uh, safe to assume at the start, but then we can confirm it. Um, so the removal of the item makes this a negative. It either needs to be negative reinforcement or negative punishment. And then um, what we see here is a decrease on the behavior because she was going every Sunday. Now she's only going on the first Sunday of every month, a decrease in the behavior making this negative punishment. Cool, cool, cool. Excelente. Well, I, again, I appreciate you all being here. I'm so glad that uh, you're here ready to learn with me. Um, these are really fun for me as well. So uh, especially when you guys are participating as much as you did tonight. So appreciate everybody um, being active. Um, I will go ahead and throw these notes into a document and send them all to you. Make sure you fill out that form if you would like to be included on that email. I'll post it one more time there for you. Um, and then make sure to check out my shop. It's really pretty. Um, and if you do need help with your BCBA exam, um, I am confident that you uh, will not find a better person to bring you to that line. Um, I, if you can find somebody who um, does what I do, please show them to me because I need to learn from them. Um, but I'm very confident that um, 
that I can bring you towards whatever your goals are for this BCBA exam and get you those letters behind your name as long as you're here working with me and putting in the effort for it. So um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, if you would like, if you are interested in um, tutoring or checking out any of my other content, definitely check out my link tree. Um, my shop is linked in there. You can purchase sessions. If you have questions about it, my email is on there too. Um, I'll put it into chat. It's understanding. Uh, behavior official at gmail.com um, but really you can contact me anywhere and I will find you um, so if it's Instagram message even to my personal or like uh, uh, Facebook message to my personal Instagram um, email whatever works for you um, I will get to you and let's crush this beast together all right. Thank you guys so much for being here again. Um, hopefully I will see you around the block. Stay tuned, stay subscribed for more content. I am working on a mock exam. It's taking me way longer than I expected, but I'm hoping to have it out in the next two to three weeks for you. Um, and it's going to be at a very fair price for a dank mock exam. I promise that. All right. I will catch you guys later. Take care. Let me know if you need anything from me or if I can help you at all. Bye.